people with comorbidities um, are far more likely to get sick and die than those without um, of SARS of of COVID nineteen caused, of course, by SARS CoV two. And that you know that line that I just read is directly from our driving SARS CoV two extinct post that we made a couple of weeks ago that we've talked about here. And uh, the evidence for that is is all over the place, really. Um, but one of the papers that uh, does a remarkable job of of, of kind of collating the evidence that exists is the one that we cited in that paper um, and also described um, at some length by Chris Martinson um, in, of Peak po- Prosperity, uh, in which he dove into this paper a bit more for a fair bit for 35 minutes or so. So we'll post the link to uh, Martinson's video as well. Um, and I'll just, if you would put this up for a moment, Zach. This is, and I think I think I mentioned uh, this paper by name before, and then I also couldn't pronounce uh, the first author's first name, Kampaniats, perhaps, um, published in Preventing Chronic Disease on the CDC site, uh, or yeah, it's not even clear to me exactly um, if it's just on the CDC site or if it's in a, um, yeah, and I guess it is in this Preventing Chronic Disease uh, journal. So the title is Underlying Medical Conditions and Severe Illness Among 540,667 Adults Hospitalized with COVID-19, March 2020 through March 2021. And uh, the upshot is really, as we have said uh, multiple times, you are much more likely to get sick and to have, a, and also separately uh, to have a very bad outcome from COVID if you have one or more uh, comorbidities. and But it's not just any comorbidities, and specifically the one that they found uh, being the most predictive of bad outcomes is obesity. And um, and then, you know, interestingly, anxiety um, and anxiety disorders is number two, and uh, neither the authors nor the paper, nor Chris Martinson talking about it, nor you know, some of his commenters were suggesting interesting things, um, you know, nor I have you know have anything definitive to say about that like what might that be one possibility is that the anxiety actually comes afterwards um right that at the point that you're hospitalized uh for covid then um you were easily diagnosable with with anxiety so you know there's a cause and effect issue um and then there's also a possibility that um because people with a lot of health problems tend to present as anxious or depressed um, because, of course, they would be, and there would be good reason for them to be, that they would then be diagnosed, you know, before ever having COVID, be diagnosed as anxious or depressed um, and be given, um, you know, the anti-anxiety or anti-depression drugs as a result. And that being on one of those things is enough to get you described as being anxious or depressed in such a study. And some of those drugs may um, also be uh, risk factors uh, for for, for COVID as well, um, although of course there's one um, that may actually run in the other direction. Fluvoxamine, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the you know the fact that you may be like more likely to get prescribed such things if you already have a suite of other health problems because you may have good reason to have anxiety may mean that that this isn't what it seems that it's actually about um, the presence of a bunch of other um, underlying health conditions. Unclear, um, but uh, but. You know the other the other predictive comorbidities are you know as as you might expect things like chronic kidney disease and you know as I said the number one uh, the number one factor um, that they found in this over half million people is uh, ob- obesity um, and so as we've said you know in service of this why does almost none of the health messaging around SARS CoV two and um, COVID seem to be about those things that you can actually take control of yourself. There is so much that we can do with diet to make us healthier and to bring bring into alignment with expected um, healthy numbers um, are you know things like our our blood sugar and our blood pressure and things like this. And obviously, the more fit you are, the more active you are, uh, the less likely you are to be obese and have other underlying health conditions. And the downside of getting your health in order is not a downside at all, right? right? So even if these things turned out to be, you know, third correlates of something else and they didn't have direct effects on COVID, you would almost certainly have greater longevity, greater happiness, et cetera, right. um, for having addressed these things. Even if it didn't turn out to have effects on COVID, which it seems clear that it would, um, it clearly would on other things. You know, metabolic syndrome is, you know, this this 
gorge uh, among Americans now. And, you know, it's not in non-weird countries. This is something about the modern, the modern lifestyle, which includes crap food and sedentary, um, sedentary lifestyles. Yeah. Um, and so I was, uh, in my conversation, uh, with, um, Patreon subscribers this morning, I was describing, uh, that effectively we have a herd of elephants in the room and this is one of them. The mm complete failure to highlight all of the easy things to do that don't appear to have a downside that do appear to contribute to your resistance to COVID. And it's, yep. it's a very strange reaction because on the one hand, we are literally at the point of, you know, uh, strong arming people into certain treatments as we are ignoring other treatments. And it's not Indeed. like all of the other treatments are controversial. Right. The fact is, vitamin D is spectacularly important. As you and I had talked about early in our, our series on COVID, we talked about extensively the evidence that vitamin D uh, is a strong contributor. And, you know, the way this works, probably if you have sufficient vitamin D, there's no benefit to extra vitamin D as far as we know. But the cost of being uh, deficient in vitamin D is very, very high with respect to contracting COVID. I was um, actually surprised at how strong the evidence has grown since the last time I looked at it. And then with regard to vitamin D in particular? Vitamin D in particular. And mm -hmm. I guess the, the reason that this is conspicuous is that we are not highlighting either the fact that time spent outside in the sun is particularly important in doing away with uh, a deficiency of vitamin D. That the clock is ticking for those of us in the northern hemisphere because yes, winter is coming. I know, you're shaking your head. You're literally shaking your head. But I tried to make it July today. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, um, this is an obvious intervention with no downside, tremendous upside, extremely inexpensive, something people can do, you know, without needing to radically alter their lifestyles. And yet for some reason, we are not recommending. And so in this case, you're talking about um, taking it sort of prophylactically, but really on an ongoing basis. Well, I would, I, I would now just tell you how I'm looking at this for myself and, and for our family, which is, I suspect, but do not know that building up vitamin D the most natural way, which is uh, with sunlight, um, has some holdover effect into winter. There's probably some period of time at which you've had little enough sun exposure that you're likely to be deficient unless you supplement. And so supplementing is um, sure to be second best, but nonetheless, I'm supplementing. Or go to some place with sun for a week. Or go to, if you, if you if, have If you that have the luxury. capacity and the luxury and yes. Indeed. Right. And if you, you know, there's also other things you can do. It's not like the sun doesn't shine uh, in the winter in most places. It does. And the problem is that you're dressed up in such a way that you don't encounter it, but you can you can adjust this to an extent. And I, and I think, and I actually would have to go back and refamiliarize myself with the, with the research, but um, because the winter sun, especially the farther from the equator you are, the winter sun, which is, you know, December through March in the Northern hemisphere and June through September in the Southern hemisphere is at such a low angle and therefore coming through so much more atmosphere yeah. um, that it takes much more exposure um, to get what you need. And then add to that the fact that you're much less of your skin is exposed. There's far le far fewer hours in the day when you could possibly be exposed, um, that it's just actually much harder. And this is, you know, this is part of why, for instance, uh, boy, which Scandinavians uh, the Vikings, I guess, who you know famously ate cod, and they were not the ones. You know, they were the ones who didn't get rickets, and no, they didn't know right what the mechanism of action was. And it turns out you don't need to know the mechanism of action for it to be a mechanism of action that works. Right. In right. fact, we've only <laughs> recently been aware of mechanisms of action at this level at all. Right. The ability to detect them is is hard enough. Um, but it certainly seems. You know, I think there's a very terrible argument to be made about, um, you know, obesity, for example, and that there's some, you know, they don't want to fat shame people. And so they're not highlighting that. I think that's an absolutely appalling justification for not highlighting it. Mm -hmm. Because for one thing, if this motivated people to get uh, healthier and to control their weight, it would have, you know, collateral health benefits. But you can't even make that argument with vitamin D. And, yep. um, and from the point of view of you know, this is psychologically stressful for all of us. As you point out, there may well be a tie-in with anxiety 
that it may be a, a comorbidity, and that therefore making, you know, making hay while the sun shines, getting out, doing activities that you can do easily when it's not cold uh, outside is good for you. It allows you to socialize in a way that isn't, at least so far as we know at this point, risky with respect to COVID. All of these things are pointing in the same direction. And so our failure to highlight all of the simple interventions that you can make that do seem to work that have collateral benefits like, you know, calming you down, improving your mental health, um, allowing you to socialize without uh, putting yourself or others in jeopardy. All of these things point in the same direction, and yet they are conspicuously absent from the advice, right? The advice is so narrowly targeted as to be suspicious.